everyone. I'm Jamie Vaughn with How She Got There, a Next Level um, podcast. And I'm here today with Alyssa Carpio from Autodesk. We are so excited to have her here today. Hi, Alyssa. How are you? Hi. How are you? It's a Monday, so happy Monday. Thank happy you, great you. start to the week. Thanks for yes. having me, Jamie. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to hear about um, your great success in technology. But first, I want to hear like, where did you grow up and what did you want to be? Gosh, um, this is the, you know, this is the hardest question because just like Emily Wapnick, I, I am a true multipotentialite, which just means mm -hmm. I have a lot of different passions and interests. Mm -hmm. But prior to, I live in San Diego, California. Okay. Ah, and, uh, but prior to this, um, my family moved every four years growing up. My mother was married to, um, my stepdad was an executive in IBM and we moved every four years. I actually graduated high school in Tokyo, Japan. I've gone to school in Atlanta, in Missouri. I've gone to school in Chicago. And then when I came to California, um, it was my choice to come to California for school. So I went to UCSD. And um, had some, you know, thought I was going to be in the Bay Area for a tech role. Um, did that for maybe like a year and then came back to San Diego. And um, I live here with my husband and my cat. But in terms of what did I want to be, which is a very stressful thing for me because I wanted to do be, to be like two, three, seven things, right? Um, I always had a love for... <laughs> for math, I always had a love for science. Uh -huh. And I always thought I was going to be at one point a chemist creating the next big breakthrough medication or drug out there to help people. But I also wanted to be a translator for the UN. Oh, wow. So I speak other languages as well. And then my other thing I thought I wanted to be was I know someone in grad school who um, was an archaeologist, yeah. and I thought I wanted to do that as well. So you'll always find me watching some sort of documentary um, about ancient civilizations and um, also documentaries around um, ancient philosophers, because I, I am fascinated by all of that. So if I could have had a role, I would have been an engineer archaeologist mm -hmm. um, who also dabbled in the lab creating medications. So I wish I could be all of those. Um, and But I can't. Um, yeah. But the role I have today is closer to what I would say is nirvana for me, because okay. it brings together, as a tech evangelist, it brings together engineering, marketing, mm -hmm. product management, and communications all in one. Now explain the tech evangelist to us, or the people who don't know what that means, including myself. <laughs> sure. Tech evangelism has had um, a few years under its belt. Mm -hmm. And I would say Microsoft is probably the first to really have this role. Most tech evangelists are engineers okay. um, who, have a pro who have a product background, product management background. And at a high level, what we do is that we try to get third party developers, companies and the community to adopt our technology. Okay. And Microsoft had a lot of those. I actually learned, uh, actually met quite a few when I first started my role. And back then I was at Intuit today. I'm at Autodesk. Mm -hmm. And um, I definitely took a lot of notes from Microsoft and how they, they think about this role. Um, this role also has some cousins, if you will, some kin. Um, you probably have heard of things like um developer relations or dev advocates, um, development advocates or developer advocates, they're very closely related. But at Autodesk, my role is about amplifying um, and putting together a cohesive story around the engineering magic behind our products. So um, I have to understand tech, but I also have to really think about the audience and think about who's going to consume this content. So I try to really always have a, a human spin and not just a coding spin on any story that we tell. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important um, with being in tech, being a tech evangelist, that you have the background in technology and you're not just doing the marketing side of things, that there's an equal balance of both? There has to be an equal balance 
in both. And the reason, well, I'm like, the first part of the role, it says tech. But the reason for that is that your customers are twofold. Mm -hmm. One, they are, as a tech evangelist, at least in my role, my customers are all developers. They're all technologists. So I have to be able to relate and understand the, the work that they're doing, but also relate it back up to business strategy. And that's where the product management side starts to kick in. Mm-hmm. But as, a, as, an ev- as an evangelist, as a tech evangelist, you must understand the environments, um, the, the, the tech stack, the environments. You have to understand the domains um, in order to be able to represent that externally and internally. I do tell stories internally. I do a lot of blogging internally as well. And I speak internally on various topics from open source to inner source to, you know, how do we increase diversity in uh, top tech talent? So I'm always, I think these are, I I think it's always a great, uh, it's a great role for those of us that are technologists that actually do like to speak and do think about things, not just as my product and the system, but being able to relate it to others that might not be technologists. So I think if you are somebody like that, that's like, um, and, and by the way, my career path has been more of a Rorschach drawing than a ladder. Um, and so if you are somebody who's like, I want to do a little bit of this and that, but I also want to still maintain being an engineer and be an engineer at heart, it's a great role. Mm-hmm. And, and it's growing. It's it's definitely growing in the industry. I'm seeing more and more of that on people's LinkedIn pages. You know, they list themselves as a tech evangelist. So thank you for the explanation of that. That was okay. great. Um, you, now you mentioned that you speak other languages. How many do you speak? And do you think that that kind of helps you also in your roles, being able to communicate maybe in a different type of form than, say, the layperson would be in the technology circuit? Currently in tech, it's <laughs> it's all English or the coding language itself. Okay. Um, externally, I use my language skills actually more externally outside of work. So the last 10 plus years, I've been doing pro bono consulting for women owned micro businesses in California, Texas and Mexico. So um, for me, the language actually helps knowing mm-hmm. different languages, being able to connect with with these with micro business owners and let me tell you why i'm specifically focused on women um, who own micro businesses and jamie you probably know this but less than four percent of startups that are led by women actually get vc funding Mm -hmm. less than 12 percent of women who own businesses actually get small business loans from banks right now there is still a bias as entrepreneurs um and I, I, this is also my, my plea out there for others out there who, who want to help female owned businesses, please do it. We can all use the, we, we can all use the help in elevating one another. Um, I think it is everyone's role to actually um, ensure that as a community of entrepreneurs that we, that we think about how do we leverage each other's skills and how do we elevate and support one another. And so um, having clients in Mexico has really helped me practice my Spanish. Yeah. Um, I also have had clients. <laughs> I did have a couple of clients in uh, the French speaking part of, of Canada. And I double my, my French isn't as great as my Spanish or Italian. But for me, it's been more understanding language languages, not, not coding languages, but the spoken mm-hmm. and the written language has really helped me. Um, I think be a better global citizen Mm -hmm. because there are so many ways and, and uh, you probably, as you get to know me a little bit more, there are many ways to say the same thing. And I'm very intentional with every word that I say because I speak other languages and actually English is my third language. I, I did not uh, grow up knowing only English. And so I've had to, I'm constantly, um, you can tell when I'm tired or I've had too many cocktails. I start to have problems translating sometimes. I'm like, wait, I know this word. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And I start describing something. Mm -hmm. Um, I still remember not remembering the word for thermometer. (laughs) 
um, <laughs> at a baby shower because I was I was tired uh, one time and I remember it was my sister's baby shower and I had to like explain it's the it's an instrument that you use to take your temperature <laughs> like you mean a thermometer see sometimes I forget mm -hmm. so I would say for those that are thinking about learning different languages for me, it's about being a better global citizen. It's about being intentional with your words, and um, which I think is about living a very mindful life. What's the best career advice that you've received as a woman in tech? I have two. Okay. One is to avoid running away from something, but instead run to something. You might be in a toxic environment or an environment where you're not growing or an environment that you're like, gosh, I didn't know this is what it was. But running away means that you won't get to that next thing that really is impactful. If you run to something, it means that you're intentional in, in what you're doing. So avoid running away. Take the time to really understand the next company, the next organization before you apply and really think about what matters to you. Mm -hmm. Then the second that I would say is um, another wisdom, and both of these I did not create. The other wisdom is from, um, she's a VP of uh, security at Adobe, and her name is Shannon Leeds. And I remember her saying to me, don't let the job get in the way of your career. Mm -hmm. This job might be comfortable because you might know people and your manager loves you. But if your next step is about that next career growth, don't let the current state dictate where you need to be. Mm -hmm. So both of those, and then that first one about running away from, not, not running away, um, mm -hmm. is from my ex-boss at Intuit, Alex Balaj, who's the Intuit chief architect. And so they're both really, I, I keep those in mind and I always, whenever people, by the way, the kinds of talks I love are all about careers. Mm -hmm. um, I do it all the time. I ask people and people ask me to be in these talks, but those are two that I always kind of, uh, that I always leverage and let people know about. I love those. I do think that we, sometimes we get too comfortable where we are instead of, you know, and it, we maybe we've outgrown that spot that we're in and it's time to go, but we're like, I really like it. <laughs> so yeah, I've, I've been there, done that it's many times where you wish that, you know, man, if I had just taken that one step, you know, that would have been, completely different outcome for me. Agree. Agree. And I don't know if you've heard this also, Jamie, where you might be with colleagues or maybe it's you where we sometimes for that next step, you say, you start to kind of tell yourself, oh, but I don't have this. I don't have that. Oh, I don't think I'm ready for this or that. The reality is, is that it's that internal voice. And this is something I tell people all the time and I have it. It's that internal voice that sometimes brings us, takes us back, right? Or brings us back. And and what you need to actually do in these instances, when, if you can recognize it, is to tell yourself um, who you are versus who you're not. Mm -hmm. You Because none of us have everything. Right. right? None yeah. of us. Even the, the, even the most brilliant CEOs out there or scientists, none of them have everything. But what they do have, they leverage really well. And I think that's the thing, especially for women in tech. I think many of us will talk ourselves out of things mm -hmm. <laughs> because, yeah. because we, we lean on what we don't know yet versus like, mm -hmm. hey, have you seen this list of stuff you do know and that you are awesome at? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very true. I think, um, especially, I think maybe women just across the board that we're conditioned to, you know, kind of take that step back and, and, and we may be the best person for that role and we didn't take that chance and you should. I had a recruiter tell me one time, she says, is there anything that you're nervous about this job? And I said, well, I don't know how to do this, this, and this. And she said, oh, forget that. There's classes for that. You fit everything else. So yeah, I, I really think that that's great advice. How do you think we get more women involved in tech, Where, whether it's reaching out behind us and pulling that next generation along, or maybe it's women within our circle that are thinking about a career change? Yeah. Um, should we take them a little bit differently? So I'll sure. start with the women who are maybe are, you know, doing something that is not in tech and mm -hmm. want to go into tech, right? Um, 
so the first thing is that in terms of because people always ask me like how I'm a teacher I'm a this I'm a that but I want to go into tech where do I start it's usually the number one question right the Mm -hmm. first thing I always ask is why do you want to Mm -hmm. and and the reason I ask that is because there are many more jobs than just being an engineer Mm -hmm. and I think too many people think it's only that or I just need to be a data scientist I'm like there are many, many roles. Um, and, and tech doesn't mean you have to all be, you know, coding. Mm-hmm. Every single engineer I know of knows that that software engineering or tech is a team sport. Mm-hmm. And it takes diverse thinking and diverse backgrounds to create any product. So I always ask, what is it that you want to do? And why do you think it's tech? And so if you're someone that is already amazing at telling stories, you know, there are many roles. There are actually roles that are called storytellers in tech today wow. that you wouldn't even know about. Uh-huh. If you are someone who is a teacher, right, and you want to go into tech and you love that aspect of creating, you know, teaching materials and creating, you know, um, content for the, for others to actually, you know, watch on, on demand, then, you know, there's instructional designers. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be a coder. There's instructional design and there's even learning development um, roles out there for teachers and for those who love teaching. Mm-hmm. So that's always my first thing. Now, if you want to go into engineering and you're going coming from a whole different background, um, I never lie. I, I'm going to tell you it's going to take some grit because mm-hmm. it's not easy. And you can't circumvent four or six years of college or grad school to get around that in a 15 week course. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like some of the like flat iron school. There are some good like coding schools out there, but there's also some freebies for those who can't afford, you know, these kinds of schools. So YouTube and TikTok probably have been my best friends when I'm like, oh my gosh, I just need to look up this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been amazing to learn languages on. Uh, and I always tell people that even Khan Academy is pretty good. But there are companies like Intuit and others that have apprenticeship programs. I don't know if you've heard of that. So mm-hmm. apprenticeship programs are really made for those that are wanting to transition out of their current uh, industry into tech. And um, they basically pay you. You're almost going in through a coding school, but you're learning all the aspects of the business, including you know being a software engineer. And at the end of it, if it all works out, then you become a full-time engineer. So there's that. Now, your other question of more general one of how do we get more women in there? I will be honest with you. I think it's it's sad to me when I looked at the, the percentage of women in uh, that are graduating from school was not any different from when I graduated and from when even from people uh, before me. And I'm older. Right. Um, I think it's I think it's it still comes down to we are not necessarily choosing STEM degrees. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some stuff back there, some baggage, right, from the Mm -hmm. past. But I also think in school, so the more traditional sense um, at universities or colleges around the world, I actually think that we can do a better job of being supportive. Mm -hmm. UC Berkeley, um, and and I'm just going to say her name, uh, Anusha Jane, she was one of the co-founders of a, um, an engineering focused sorority, and I remember meeting her, I spoke at, at one of her events and I remember meeting her and I said to her, and by the way, she is now, a, she was a software engineer term product manager. Um, she's now in Canada. And I remember talking to her like, gosh, I wish I had a sorority when I was going to school because I remember going to class in my upper division and I, w- I look, you look left, right behind you in front of you and you might be the only woman. Mm-hmm. And it gets, it gets to you because I remember at one point I thought, is this what it's going to be? I don't want to be the only one. Right. And yet when I started at Intuit, I was one of eight women in a building of 350. Wow. And I was one of two of those eight women that was not married. And between the two of us that were single, I was the only one that was an engineer. Mm-hmm. And so you start to really, and, and you start to really think about, is this a tough place to be? Um, when I started, I was called kid. I, it stopped. Let me tell you, after the third time, I was called a kid in a meeting. You know, what does the kid think? Um, and I'm in the room. And 
you realize that we as women in tech, one, we have to stand our own ground, but two, we actually need to support each other in meetings, mm-hmm. you know, and I've heard of women who tell me, Elisa, it was really rough and you know it, it was really rough to get here. I just feel like everyone's got to go through it. I'm like, well, that's like the wrong way to think about it right. because the, the wrong way to think about it is I suffered. Therefore you should suffer. Mm-hmm. Instead, I suffered and I've learned. Let me teach you what I've learned. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully the others that follow you will learn new lessons and different lessons that they could pass on. And I think that's everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I do want to urge the moms and the dads out there who are, you know, who have a daughter that might be, you know, starting to think about what do I want to be is to, you know, is to have them consider dabbling in tech, have them consider dabbling in, you know, I still remember my, my niece, we went to, we always go to Cape Cod and I still remember her telling me, I learned how to code. And I'm like, what, what? And you know, she coded this little dancing thing. It was on one hour of code um, and app. And I just remember she was so excited. The cats moved back, they moved forward and then they, you know, danced and I had to tweet about it. And yes, it's not, maybe that's not what she's going to be, but opening their eyes and opening them to the possibility of being able to create and being able to see what you created in a short amount of time is amazing. Mm -hmm. All of us here are put on this world, right? to hopefully make an impact um, for the world and to also create a legacy for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think we are all better off when we are open to different experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we teach, we have better lessons to tell the younger generation and we have, and I think we approach our work in a more holistic way Mm -hmm. when we dabble in different things. And when we expose young people into different things, I think they start to think about that this world isn't one-sided or two-sided. There's many, many things that, that many problems to be solved and many ways that we could solve it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully from all of that, you know, we will have tech and solutions that are much more inclusive. I joke around, but I'm not going to joke. Well, I joke around about this, but it's not. I'm a three-time cancer survivor. And let me tell you, um, if I always talk about, if I was to do it over again, I would love to go back and work on medical devices because Mm -hmm. no woman would have created that machine that does your mammograms in that way. No, (laughs) no. Right. Yeah. Right. And yet I can tell you right now, their customers were all women. And Mm -hmm. even if you tell me, oh, it's a newer machine it is still a painful experience. Um, It's also something that I'm like, is that, I mean, could there be other designs? Yes, there could be. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think we can create, but by exposing more women and younger women into thinking about tech, it isn't one-sided. And I think we would create more inclusive, safer, more respectful Mm -hmm. uh, solutions out there. Mm -hmm. You have inspired me today. I I would love to hear what inspires you. Everything inspires me. Um, I will tell you that I take inspiration from everything. But I think for me, I am always inspired by watching and learning from young kids. Because mm-hmm. everything is always new. And everything is always exciting. And what I take away from that is each day. And in fact, I just said that to someone today. Each day I approach it with a mindset of being open, which means I know nothing and I'm here to learn. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, I think, yes, it's a vulnerable state to be in. But man, I've been able to get others to help me learn faster. But it also opens people up to reach out and want to help you, right? Um, And I see that in young kids especially, um, they're open to learning. They're open to getting help. They know that they don't know something or can't reach something and they will ask for help. Mm -hmm. I think it's 
I think every day, whenever I watch young, you know, young kids, whether they're babies or not, um, whether it's on Instagram or in my own family and friends, I'm always inspired by how they see life mm-hmm. and how they see how to solve problems. Um, because I think many times we get stuck as adults uh, thinking that we well, have done it this way, this way has worked. But really, there are other ways. And maybe now there's new and better ways if we could just stop and say, I'm open. Mm-hmm. I'm here to learn. And if you just tell yourself, I know nothing and approach and approach that, I think you'll get more partners. I think you'll have more people wanting to help you. And most likely, you'll get further in what you're trying to do. Uh, well, I have loved talking to you today. Oh, you thank you. Me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, it was so inspiring. And congratulations on being a three-time cancer survivor. That's a hard oh, thing to do. Thank so. you. That's a whole other conversation, being a woman in tech and being a three-time cancer survivor. Um, I have a podcast that I did last year too, and I mentioned this and it was all around grit. It was hard for me in the beginning to be able to say that I had cancer because I didn't want to be seen as less. It was very interesting to go through that as a woman in tech Mm -hmm. when you're, there's very few of you. (laughs) Um, And so, um, but I've come to my own and and I have no problems now sharing that. Yeah. But thank you. Yeah. Well, Alyssa, thank you so much and have a great day. And I know that this talk is going to inspire some other women. And maybe maybe we'll have somebody on here watching it going, I want to create a new mammogram machine. That would be wonderful. (laughs) Like, oh my gosh. Let me tell you, I wish, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I wish, I I do. So thank you, Jamie, and thank you for um, how she got their podcast team for inviting me. Have a great one. See you. Just a